So I'm here to talk about uh, what we call hyperscaler storage today. Um, it's, it's disrupting the storage industry, basically. And so I want to get you guys' feedback on what you see in this new area and uh, how we can better address it. So <clears throat> what we mean by hyperscalers are the, the really big internet guys, right? There's, there's basically four in the U.S. There's Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft Azure as far as market share. You might want to throw an Apple there. They're starting to move away from some of these public cloud providers into building their own data centers. In China, there's another one, another three, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, right? Uh, and <clears throat> in China, they don't actually build their own data centers. The, these guys sort of build data centers on spec and hope that these hyperscalers will actually come in and, and use them. Um, <clears throat> How does that go? Is that just the building? Or is that That's the building, the equipment, the power, the cooling, everything, right? And so, so, so here's a data center. The racks build but not it, the content. and I hope you come. <laughs> That's a step up from Equinix, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in the U.S., uh, these guys are actually building data centers worldwide, um, trying to get as close to the customer as they can to reduce the latencies, of course. Um, and I don't think it's any news to anybody here, but they're not buying enterprise storage from enterprise storage vendors. <clears throat> they're building their own systems, right? They're all, you know, they're buying disk drives directly from the disk drive manufacturers in a lot of cases or, or through somebody that bends sheet metal around them, right? And so <clears throat> it's, it, it's estimated that like half of all the bytes shipped from the storage industry are going to these guys. Oh, no, and my sources tell me that, that those guys actually pay less for a disk drive than EMC pays for a disk drive. Oh, yeah, well, I'm talking about bytes. <clears throat> Bytes yeah. shipped. Yeah, but right. but, <clears throat> yes. but Google gets containers of, of disk drives from Seagate chip of, cheaper than EMC chips. gets their truckloads. They get container loads of drives, and and they build. Uh, so so a design win is a data center, right? So if I can get in and supply my equi my components, not equipment, components into that data center, that's a design win. That's a huge amount of uh, market share. And uh, it's growing. It's growing at least 20%. Certain areas of that are growing much faster than that. And <clears throat> at least up until recently and, and still to this day, they don't need standards. They have the power of the dollar to go in and tell us as component vendors what features to add and what the interface is, right? Implement this interface. I don't care if it's standard. It's, that's what I'm building to, right? So <clears throat> that causes problems, of course, for the, the guys that are supplying these components because they have to customize them for each one of these customers. So we'd like to get them on board and agree on what they need and so that we can get uh, one kind of through, you know, uh, part number to, for all these guys, right? Um, and <clears throat> there's also the software-defined storage, which you know and love, hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, is used to build storage systems out of commodity components, or best in class commodity components, maybe, right? And so we're starting to see a trend now where the enterprises themselves are not buying from enterprise storage vendors either. They're putting together the, their own storage systems with software-defined storage and, and data center management, the custom code things, and they're you know, disrupting the storage market as well. Any questions on that? Any controversy? Um, back uh, last year at FAST, there was a, a great paper talked about by Eric Brewer of, of Cap Theorem fame. And, uh, and he has some somewhat interesting ideas about how the future of disk drives should be, right? And <clears throat> so they're looking at, uh, you know, having things to reduce what's called tail latency. And, and you probably heard about tail latency. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, these are the important things they, they would like. Uh, it must be an abstraction 
instruction layer with multiple implementations. Uh, you mean like a standard? <laughs> and uh, and so there there actually had a session yesterday at the the Open Compute Project Summit that's uh, that was over here at Santa Clara, where they're proposing a sort of a pre-IO retry policy where. If uh, I can't deliver the data within some certain amount of uh, minimal time, in other words, I might have to do some ECC correction, I might have to wait for the head to go around or the platter to come around under the head again, those kind of things, they say, just give up. I've got two or three copies. The, the software-defined storage is already keeping multiple copies of the data in different failure domains, right? And so if I can get the data from that drive somewhere else faster than it takes you to recover it off of your drive, just give up. You know, don't, don't, don't keep trying. Well, isn't that just an extension of the time-limited error recovery that's on RAID drives? It, it's, it's more important than, well, it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of form from when to when, right? Yeah. It, it it's, has nothing to do with when you put it in the queue. It's when the drive gets it and starts executing. As soon as it knows, that it's not going to be able to deliver it, right? You know, in the normal time, give up that. Yeah, well, it's right? extending it to cover things like right. this is a redirected block, and yes. so I'll just fail because it's a redirected block and let the other guy handle. Correct. it. Correct. Um, the other thing, and and this is coming in uh, NVMe, is uh, maybe that's your default all the time, is the fast fail, right? Because I want it all all the time, and then my override would really be try really hard. To get this data, this one time, because I w already went to the second and third place for my data, and they told me fast fail too. So now, really, really try and recover this because uh, I, I need to get the data to the customer. So, more on tail latency. Uh, back at the 2014 FAST conference, there was a, a paper, and then uh, updated by at the FAST 16 uh, conference as well. And they had access to 450,000 disks and another 4,000 SSDs for a total of 87 days, right? And so that accumulated to this amount of drive hours. But uh, really, the bottom line is between 1.5% and 2.2% of the time, they got a tail latency. What is a tail latency? It's anywhere between 2 and 10 times slower than your normal response. And you think, eh, it's not a big deal, you know? But they have so many layers and so many uh, uh, sort of concurrent operations in the scale-out environment that it does cause problems. It's, it's like one out of every 100 customer accesses is slowing down and sometimes failing. That's a big deal. It, it, it's interesting, it's three times worse for SSDs than for HDDs. Well, and part of it has to do with the background processes, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a heck of a lot more background processes in the SSD than in HDD. Right, no, and you guys were talking about host-managed SSDs yeah, to yeah, address yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they did find that, that after a while, the drives would operate fine again. Right, because like they finished the hours, garbage you know, collection. All the garbage collection's done. They got a bunch of erased blocks out there. They've done all the, the background scans for uh, data corruption. So now they can service the request really fast. So, so that's what's happening. And that's what they would like to get us to change, not just through the RFP process, but we're starting to see these hyperscalers actually participate in standards organizations so that we can supply them as, a, as an industry with something that, that works across all our devices. So when they build out their own storage system, that data availability and protection is done by, um, by cheap stuff, right? They don't need dual power supplies. They don't need dual ported anything. They expect things to fail. In fact, everything in the whole data center is planned on failing at some point. And so they've got all their higher level software uh, architected around the, the fact these things do fail. And they let them fail. They, they're aware of predictions of failure, right? But those predictions are just as likely to produce a false positive as a false negative, right? So everybody I've talked to in this world says, no, we, we just let it fail, right? 
we, we keep track of whether it was predicted before it failed, right? But we also, also don't want to take a, a perfectly good part out of service just because you predicted it was going to fail. Because we know half the time that that's not even true, right? So, so you get direct attached storage, uh, but we're starting to see now, and, and there was some really cool uh, hardware uh, at the OCP conference this week. Um, if you're a hardware geek, it was like, oh man, this is really cool. The way they've, uh, you can now hot plug drives vertically. You pull out a tray, and you can hot plug drives like this. They've got some uh, pretty interesting things where you don't even have to have uh, a, a carrier attached to the drive itself. Hmm. You just open it up and the drive itself pulls right out. <clears throat> we'll see how it works. But they have a follow-on to Honey Badger now uh, that's called, uh, I think it's called Rockford or something. Yeah, and then they've got a second version of this uh, Lightning. Lightning is uh, J. Boff, just a bunch of flash. And uh, the idea there is you take multiple hosts, like I think it's four hosts, multiple PCIe lanes into a single enclosure with the PCI switch, fan it back out to a bunch of NVMe drives. And, and they have uh, a cute little uh, contain, uh, sort of a, a, a two and a half inch chassis for M.2 drives, right? Because M.2 are not hot pluggable, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, but these guys don't need hot pluggable. Right. Well, they do when this in the carrier. So, so the way this Lightning 2 works is they put two M2 drives and a little board on there to make it you know, look like a four port, two and a half inch drive, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and they had to go in and change a significant amount of the Linux stack uh, in order to allow hot plug not to, do, not to cause this cascade of IOs. Um, uh, to try and recover it, because because uh, the NVMe spec has a little problem there, right? But they almost always have their own custom data center monitoring software, right? They've all written this from scratch, right? Their their view on the world is, hey, we have programmers, our programmers can do that. Why should we pay you for your IP in your storage device when we have programmers that can do the same thing, and they have. And, uh, and their stuff works at scale. I mean, huge scales. Um, and, and storage vendors themselves are still having trouble coming up to that scale. So what do we do about tail latency remediation? We talked about the per I.O. tag. Um, there's also <coughs> uh, a way to, to possibly detect these slow drives, because they keep, they keep statistics on all these components. Right. This, this can make them a very difficult customer to deal with because when they tell you your drives are bad, you better believe your drives are bad. You can't argue against it, right? They will dump you know, pages and pages of the history of your component in their environment. And it's never been over the spec uh, environment that, that, that you require for their, you know, their environment. So, um, <clears throat> and then... The idea here is that you know, the software-defined storage is going to automatically restore whatever redundancy you have for your data. If, if one drive fails, hey, I've got other places to put that data, right? Um, so we're looking at standards. Uh, one in particular uh, I'm going to talk about is, can we take these drives that are starting to age, starting to wear, starting to lose components inside of them and, and keep them in service, right? Don't fail it just because one of the seven heads has gone bad. Somehow remove that seventh head from the drive and then put a smaller drive back in service, for example. But the, the current drives don't allow per IHO hitting. They Remap the LBAs on, only on true media failure, not on media slowness. Um, well, obviously, they do keep track of failed media areas and, and remap the bad blocks. But when those start to run out of spare media, you get problems, right? So you need to sort of be able to, to do this reconstitution.
So the DPOP standard, this has uh, been approved now in T13 for the SATA interface and hoping that will be finalized next week in Phoenix for the T10 SAS interface. And this is exactly what I was explaining is you want to be able to repurpose the drive by removing some of the, the failing, slow, non-operational kind of elements of the drive. Could be a head, could be a media service, could be a die in an SSD, for example, right? And there's no reason to, to, to fail and return an entire drive if you can keep that drive going with a smaller media area. Gee, smaller. Steve Sokola said things like that a decade ago. Yeah. We're finally putting them into a standard. <laughs> <laughs> so this means that, uh, that hyperscalers can start requiring the drive vendors to implement the DPOP feature in their interfaces. And instead of completely taking them out of service, which is something Microsoft Azure does, if they start seeing a lot of tails, tail latency from a drive, they just say it's bad. They take it completely out of service all 10 terabytes of it or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then they return it to the, the vendor, and the vendor's got to take it back. Well, actually, they don't take the physical drive back. But, the, but they have to send you a new one because you're Microsoft. That's right. Well, and, and you've certified on a piece of paper that that drive is now drive dust. Right. <laughs> we'll give you the drive dust back if you want. <laughs> but uh, accept this piece of paper and give me a new drive. So, uh, so it's a command, it's an operation that results in a new smaller drive, uh, with lower capacity, uh, but not necessarily less performant. Uh, streams is a concept that associates, you guys know, are familiar with streams at all? Um, we're not. It's associating multiple blocks with an upper level construct, right? Either a file, an object, or something, right? And so you have multiple blocks in your SSD or, or your hard drive. Uh, that are all part of a file, are all part of the object. Why do this? Well, because you'd like to be able, when that file is deleted, know which uh, blocks were corresponding to that file and free up those. And in an SSD, you would like to have those all in the same erase block, so contiguous blocks in the same erase block. Mark, is this yeah. uh, similar to something like MSWs and so on? Similar to what? MSWs, multi-stream writes. Ah, uh, that, that's a uh, Samsung term for this. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. Got it. So they, the SSDs can then uh, consolidate the LBAs associated with the stream into one or more of these write blocks. And then when you do a trim on a file or object deletion, you get a nice, you know, uh, set of erase blocks as a result. You don't have to do a read, modify, write because you only deleted a couple blocks out of that entire write block. Does so that make sense? So the big benefit of this is write amplification factor, right? Your drive is going to last a lot, a lot longer if you cut the write amplification factor down to about one or some, some number above one. Uh, but it also improves the, the performance because when you do writes, and you do a whole file's worth of writes, uh, those erase blocks are already there. So I've actually prepared the space for you to do the write by erasing a bunch of, of blocks ahead of your write. So you do a write, 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 and you don't have to do any erases first. Erases are expensive if, in terms of latency. Where, where on the drive is this kept, this information about the association? It's not kept. It's kept while you're writing that stream. It's like tagging, it's tagging the block? Yeah, yeah. It, a, so it's on the media. It's you, up. Open, you do a write stream command, right? And you say what your stream number is. The drive doesn't even give you stream numbers. The host creates them, okay. right? So he's saying all these writes, write, 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 are associated with one stream. And so put them in a consecutive write block. Mm -hmm logically consecutive. So is this sufficiently built into the SCSI command set that we can stretch it through a block array? So that yes. a file system can yes. set? Okay. NetApp uh, implements this on the front end of their array as well. Right, but yeah, but so we need a file system that implements it talking to an array that implements it, which right. can then pass it all the way down to an SSD that implements it. Right. 
Correct. <laughs> so, uh, so for NVMe, it's part of the current uh, 1.3 release Canada, which is out today or tomorrow, today or Monday. Uh, for SAS, this is supported by the right stream command I just talked about. SBC, this is the stream could call subclause in uh, 4.24. And for SATA, uh, it's not there yet. Questions? Okay. So I mentioned background operations. There's things like garbage collection, scrubbing, which is, you know, sort of a read scan to see if there's any ECC bits uh, flagged, you know, if uh, there's something called read disturb, you guys familiar with read disturb in an SSD drive? No. When you read the, uh, you know, charge trap or other techniques, uh, what you're doing is you're applying a voltage and measuring a voltage, right? And that tends to scatter the electrons a little bit into the adjacent pieces of silicon that are other right lines. Okay, and so if you read, 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 read enough times, you know, thousands of times actually, but those electrons start altering the data that's in those adjacent tracks. Read disturb. Read disturb. Oh. So you have to, you know, there's a couple things you can do. One is you can have a count of how many times you've read that location, that physical location, which maps to any number of logical locations, right? Uh, another one, though, is the scrubbing thing where you, you basically scan and you just do reads. Now, that, that's the uh, uh, Heisenberg, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but by measuring something, you will alter it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, the background scan is uh, actually part of the problem, but it will detect the problem as well because you'll get an ECC error, hmm. and then you can reconstitute the, the real data and write it somewhere else and then just map that logical space down to the new physical space, right? Uh, remapping, uh, cache flushes, there's a lot of SSDs have a, a write buffer uh, so that they can immediately reply to you on a write and say, yeah, I got it, it's on the media, sort of. <laughs> um, <clears throat> continuous self-tests, and, and, but, but the thing is, when you, want, when you want to get the data from a hyperscale application, you want it right now. And you want it consistently right now. You don't want it to take you know, twice as long or 10 times as long in some cases because you got some background text, right? So, so if we can give the host some ability to affect the scheduling of these operations, um, then they can schedule it at a time, such as while they're writing, for example, uh, that reduces the, the impact on their, on their I.O which is the, the read determinism uh, that they're really looking for. You're basically looking to make tail latency just predictable. They're making what? The tail latency predictable. Uh, they're been... getting rid of the tail latency, at least for reads. Okay. All right? So what they would like to do is say, you know, I want reads like from an SSD in 200 microseconds. Mm -hmm. Consistently 200 microseconds, right? Not right. sometimes two milliseconds, right? And so, so that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to push these uh, background control streams uh, and something called IO determinism down into these standards so that they can get that consistent latency every time. Um, so this is uh, uh, what NVMe is calling NVM sets. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But for SAS, uh, this has a uh, background control command, SBC4. And SATA, uh, Advanced Background Operations Feature Set. So, so uh, SAS and SATA already have it. NVMe is about to have it, probably in 1.4. And that's the control over the back, the, the host control managed over drive background stuff. That, tasks, yeah. right? So that I can do my reads deterministically. Well, does that also, is that also the stuff you guys were talking about about a year ago where it's, I've got three banks of SSDs and I tell them when to do garbage collection so I can always write to the ones that aren't? It's, all, it's more like I can always have a couple to read from okay. while I'm writing to the third one. Right? So the opposite so, problem. Right, yeah. So, so I know that when I'm writing, I can't do deterministic reads, 
right. I might encounter a block I have to erase, or right. write itself can be on the channel or on that die at the same time right. I'm trying to read from it. Yeah. Yeah, no, the stuff I'm thinking of was about to, was trying to solve the unpredictable write latency problem. Yeah, that, this doesn't solve that. Okay. All right. Um, now, there's an alternate approach which says, um, from the host software point of view, I want more control over this SSD. Not only do I want to hold up back background tests, I want to do the scan from the host. I want to do a bunch of flash translation logic <coughs> on the host. Just give me a physical NAND, right? And, and I'll do all the stuff that the, the drive would normally do. And this has seen some success, but... I'm having Fusion IO flashbacks. Yeah. Uh, there's this open source project called Light NVM. Um, there was um, a paper at this year's FAST from Microsoft called Flashbox, where, where they're doing their own flash translation, at least in the research side of things. And uh, my understanding is that Google has always had their own flash translation layer, and they just buy raw flash from whoever will sell it to them, right? So, so yeah, that, that gives you ultimate control, but it's, uh, it's, it's not something that the SSD manufacturers are very excited about. As well, no, because now you're adding no value except yeah, the case. Right. <coughs> Even though some of the SSD manufacturers also have their own fabs and make flash, um, uh, you may have difficulty getting raw flash from uh, one of these SSD suppliers. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. And then I talked about fast fail, but in SAS and SATA, there's already this thing called rebuild assist mode. And this was intended uh, for when a drive in a RAID box fails, Right, I would like, I would like it to give up quickly in that case as well. So they could use this uh, mode of of the drive to get sort of that fast fail that they're looking for, right? Because in, in the RAID rebuild case, you know, you want to know if what's there still needs to be recreated from the parity of the other drives, right? So if it fails fast, then you know, oh, okay, I'm just going to write it. So you can do it uh, on a per I.O. basis, or you can just uh, put the drive in that mode uh, constantly and, and, uh, and get it back. When an error is detected, the drive tells the host not only about the error of the requested block, but it also tells the host about the other errors in a related contiguous chunk. So this would happen if your head bounced off the media and it, and it took out several blocks along with it, for example. Uh, so, so there's a T10 subclause 420 rebuild assist mode. There's also a T13 uh, version in ACS4. And then uh, for NVMe, the fast fail is part of this IO determinism we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, uh, the OCP storage group uh, that I just talked about is proposing, to, uh, proposing a separate fast fail for hard drives that it would take to T10 and T13, but the NVMe version is more focused on keeping the drive constantly in fast fail, like the rebuild assist mode of SAS and SATA, and then overriding it when they actually really do need that data, regardless of, of the timing. So uh, they are trying to get SSD vendors to expose more information about the internal organization of the drives, uh, but really they don't really care so much about the internal organization as long as they can get these deterministic reads. The other issue, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is their goal, right? They would like to get 200 microsecond read responses and only violate that one in a million times. <laughs> But that's, you know, six nines worth of predictability to get that 200 microseconds. That's a big task, right? And, and you obviously can't be running background scans or any other background operations. How, how close are we to that 
sort of meeting that sort of requirement? Is that a long way off, or is that something that's coming soon? It, it, it's here, yeah. It's here now. Hmm. And again, if you, if you could, if you had the raw flash, you could guarantee that easily. Well, that accelero uh, subject, the accelero test, you know, the standard deviation. Now, it was 227, other, but the standard deviation was <coughs> 200 microseconds. So. The, the other variable here, though, that's not said up here, is Uber. You know what Uber is? Uncorrectable bit error rate, right? So if you want good data with this kind of timing, that might be a little difficult. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you actually want your data. <laughs> oh. Well, you want it to be correct. <laughs> So, um, so the other problem um, is that the drives are getting too big, right? Uh, this wasn't really a problem with SSDs until recently. But uh, they, in a lot of cases, are reselling this storage area to a cloud customer, right? And they're guaranteeing certain service levels to that cloud customer, and they're their thinking is that about what you'd want for a normal data set size is around a terabyte. So like Cassandra DB, RocksDB, whatever the app that they're using, uh, you know, they sell on the basis of terabytes. You get one terabyte or two terabytes. So it's in, in terabyte chunks almost, uh, what you pay for on a gigabyte per month basis, right? And so they would like to take your four terabyte SSD and split it up into four different one terabyte SSDs. And the, the major thing that they want is not just virtualization, right, which would be you know, four namespaces in a single controller. They want each of these one terabyte SSDs to be isolated from each other. That means I can read and write on this and it doesn't affect the read response time on this. So if you think about how the uh, SSD is in, in internally architected, right? Mm -hmm. You have channels and dies, right? So they're basically saying, you know, take those channels with, you know, 8, 16, 32, whatever dies attached to it and make that one NVM set, one mini SSD. And because they're all on a separate channel, then the next channel over can be another NVM set, another one terabyte chunk, and, and reads and writes to it, since they're on a separate channel from the first one, uh, will be isolated, latency-wise. Make sense? So by channel there, are you talking about PCA lanes? No, no, I'm talking in, inside the drive. Oh, back-end channels. Yeah, back-end channels, channels that talk from, from the controller to the actual die. Right, okay. Right. So what's the purpose of the isolation if they're still coming through the same? You know? Noisy neighbor problem, right? I have, you know, I have four different apps. Each get a terabyte mini SSD, right? And if this one's really busy, it doesn't affect this one over here. Oh, I get that, but at some point at the same, they're getting full physical lanes all the way down, you're saying? Yeah, they're, 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 there's still contention on the PCI lanes. Yeah. That's what I mean. At some point they're, they're sharing something. That's almost in the noise, though, the, yeah. the, the contention yeah. on the PCI lanes. Yeah. Compared to what can happen inside the drive if you misconfigure it and that means all the flash translation layer is gone, all that, you know, all that no, no, right. No, 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 yeah. it's still there. The, the background tests are done by the drive, right? The the uh, But if it's gonna map some some logical block address to some physical block address, it could be in a different die, different channel, you know, all that other stuff. Yeah, so. well what you have to do again, within that partition then well, in that partition is where you're doing the background tasks. What about the right buffer and all that stuff? Right be buffer gets divided, well. right? So you got a little bit of right buffer here, here, and here, right? So it, it's a very, it, it, I compare it to virtualization. Why don't you just have four but, small drives? I but mean, the right buffer know. would be on one, sharing it, the same channel now. It's, no, no, that, that, so it's, it's a, it's well, an, it's isolation if you do that. It's an no. abstraction of one SSD into four small SSDs. It's not an abstraction. It's, it's, it's physical. It's, division. No, it's, it's not virtual. It's physical. Well, it's dynamic, though. No, it's and, not dynamic. <laughs> well, I mean, when you <laughs> it, when you install the SSD, it would it would be dynamic. I don't want to order a okay, four yeah. at the configuration yeah. time of the SSD. You would right. say, I want and two you say terabyte and drive, so there's ter one terabyte drive. Four <laughs> PCIe lanes come into the controller. They hit the the common DRAM, and then there's 16 die channels. Four go to each of the four logical SSDs. Yeah. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoy this exchange, I re- recommend subscribing to the Graybeards on Storage podcast. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you that plug. thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> because we guy. do that on the podcast a lot. <laughs> you can't buy that kind of yes. <laughs> I, I can't buy that kind of advertising. All right. So, so the current thinking is the drive shows up from the vendor, and it's already broken up into NVM sets the way the customer put it in their RFP, right? Whoa. Uh, maybe there's a utility that lets you configure these MVM sets after the after the fact after you've shipped, uh, but it's proprietary. There's no plan to put an interoperable way of provisioning MVM sets in the current 1.4 spec that could come later. But the the current thinking on the background tasks is that the host would like alternate between periods of time or windows during which it can do deterministic reads, and all background tasks are held off. And then switch to a, a period of writing in background tasks, a non-deterministic mode or window during which you could write all you want because it, you're not expecting a deterministic read out of that. So would that device. round robin to different That's sectors? That's right. You've got three copies of your data. You put one in deterministic mode. You read from it. Uh, now you have a write to do. Well, you put it in non-deterministic mode and do your writing there. Mm-hmm. And then you put the next one in non-deterministic mode and do it right there, right? So your object like, goes this drive, this drive, this drive, and the rest of the time it's, it's able to do deterministic reads. And if you can get these 200 microsecond reads from three different drives, think of the throughput, right, on a, on a, on a read of an object with three copies of the data. Yeah. Okay? Um, and then the interesting thing, I think, about the market here is that there's kind of this new category of storage vendors called uh, original design ODM. manufacturers, or ODMs. You guys familiar with this? Um, yeah? Uh, so they, they package this stuff up, right? And, uh, <clears throat> and they put it in the racks, and they deliver it to the customer, right? So... In actuality, they're not buying container loads worth of actual disk drives. They're buying container loads of disk drives already assembled in racks, already with the sheet metal bent around them and everything. And so, uh, like I said, they can leverage hardware, software designs for a compute project. Or I mentioned these Chinese hyperscalers. They've got something called Scorpio. You guys heard of Scorpio? It is the equivalent in China of OCP because, of course, they couldn't just use OCP. Um, And there's also an organization there called Open Data Center Committee, uh, which which is in charge of Scopio. And so... um, And you left out Open19, who spoke to us yesterday. Yes, Open19 is another example, right? Um, All right, so this isn't just the hyperscalers, right? These same techniques are being copied by large enterprise customers, right? And um, we were told we couldn't use the name of the actual bank, but then uh, the Wikibon guys went and spilled the beans. Uh, So uh, this is actually Citibank. A friend of mine that used to work with me at Sun um, has uh, embraced this whole approach to his own data centers. And so they create their own internal private cloud for their own IT projects. They do use some public cloud, but for the most part, they have to comply with over 200 different country regulations on their banking business, right? And I'm sorry, Google and Amazon are not gonna do that for you. So they have to do it themselves. <clears throat> but their storage budget dwarfs the revenue of most medium-sized storage vendors. So this is a business, and, it, and <laughs> this business is not going to your NetApps and Dells and, and HPE guys, right? <clears throat> so um, they have tens of thousands of nodes with around 200 petabytes of active data and a half an exabyte of inactive data. They're growing at about 45% annually, um, trillions of transactions daily, and this is important. Downtime is very expensive for these banks, right? If they can't conduct transactions, they're losing money like you would believe. They're big enough that the, that the vendors are going to custom build whatever they want, just like the hyperscalers, right? But they also have a policy of no single source for any of the, that hardware. 
They create these six petabyte pods that are about half CPU and half storage. And they're assembled by this ODM direct vendor. Then they install the pod in this new data center they're building or, or repurposing. They bought the first pod in 2015, and, uh, and now they're basically all flash pods. They're not buying any spinning rust anymore. And their cost savings to be 50% over the traditional enterprise storage. That's the kind of economic benefit that is just disrupting the storage industry, right? How can, how can EMC lower their margins? They can't. They're not <laughs> making 50% margins. <laughs> Um, they use software-defined storage and have the best-in-class commodity hardware. Uh, about 11% of their storage is SDS today, and so that's all the greenfield stuff. All the brown still field stuff is still uh, the majority yeah, the, of their The instance. core banking transactions are still on traditional stuff. Yeah, and in some cases, mainframe still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they license their SD. See from a major vendor, and Wikibun sp uh, spilled beans on that too. If you're interested, go read the Wikibun article. Uh, they have an S3 compatible interface out of that and uh, provide mainly uh, block uh, uh, stor storage services for their existing uh, applications. They're looking at Ceph, they're looking at NVMe, but uh, that's in the future. Mark, could you go back to the prior slide? I just want to look at something. Do you think that's 50% cost savings on? Traditional storage? That and includes all their people costs. Admin. Admin. But they're still, they're, they're, what I will say is that their you know, number of storage systems or number of petabytes per administrator is still not anywhere near what the hyperscalers are able to do. Because right? they have a lot of legacy equipment they still have to. Well, and, they, and they also have a much larger, larger number of applications. Right. It's, you know, we, we talk about number of servers and number of petabytes, but what really drives <coughs> admin costs is the number of different applications. Sure. If you're Facebook and you've got five applications over a million servers, it's very different. Yes. Amazon might be, a, be approaching it. And did you mention did, the software defined? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, did they spill the beans on the SDS platform? Uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, EMC's or Dell's uh, Scale IO? storage. Which one? VxRail. Huh? VxRail, isn't it? Scale IO. No, no, not VxRail. Scale IO? That's what that, yeah. oh. Oh. I don't Go read the Wikibon article. Gotcha. I didn't put it in the slides. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to wrap up here. We're running out of time. Um, <coughs> SNEA is itself trying to pivot and address this market. Um, we do have uh, pretty much all of the drive vendors, component vendors. Uh, involved in SNIA. What we don't have is a Google, an Amazon, an Apple, a Facebook on our board. We used to have Microsoft. <laughs> Still a member. But, but SW retired. Yeah, SW is forced to retire. Anybody wants to hire SW? <laughs> um, so <clears throat> we're looking at, do we do, we do a twigs? Do we do initiatives or adoptions? So uh, if there's... Um, you know, sufficient interest in, in forming those things, we'll, we'll do those. But otherwise, we, we meet about once a month or so and talk about uh, maybe we should do a white paper talking about this. Uh, the TC does have a white paper out there. Um, and so we really want to pay increasing attention to the, the hyperscaler storage market. Um, we don't want the industry to fracture uh, via the R RFP process. Uh, we want to coordinate those hyperscaler requirements and feed them into some of these other organizations. And uh, since we do have the right stakeholders, uh, we want to be able to um, provide that forum for them. Uh, here's, here's the TC white paper we did at, at uh, uh, SDC last year. So go get that. We'll probably update it again for this year's SDC. And then there's also, oh, there's also a white paper from the Cloud Storage Initiative that goes into more detail on the Citibank uh, deployment. 